we have um, Anna Sokol, who is our first presentation here to talk about geospatial strategy for GIS managers. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Let me share my screen. I assume, can everybody see slides? I'm going to be asking, I see 62 participants on the participant panel and I see like six people on video. So I will just as a, uh, I know this is maybe a uh, the beginning of the day, a PSA for all the, you know, presenter, people presenting, um, it's a lot better to present and be able to like look at faces and see if you're like not or think I'm crazy during the day versus just staring at a blank screen for hours. So just my <laughs> personal two cents, turn on your videos. It's nice. Um, and uh, if you, if you're so inclined, <laughs> peer pressure, it's the first move of any good presentation, right? Um, well, thank you all for having me. I'm happy to be here. I um, am curious, um, just before I introduce myself and before I get started, um, if you can go into the participant panel in Zoom and there's a little yes, no buttons. Can you guys click yes if you have seen a presentation on geospatial strategy before or heard of this concept before? Bonus points if you saw me kick my kid out of a, com a presentation <laughs> during the Ezra user conference. Anybody? I know there were a couple people. That was the best. He was so cute and so poorly timed. So if you're, if you're in for a good, uh, just skip ahead to minute 44. You don't need to rewatch the presentation, but if you want to see me boot my four-year-old out of the basement in the middle of the presentation, it's a lot of fun. Um, okay, so um, it looks like most people have not seen a presentation on this topic, so that's good. That, that, that gives me some good context. Thank you guys for, um, for responding. Um, so uh, nice to virtually meet you all. My name is Anna Sokol. I'm uh, with Esri Professional Services, and I um, support our geospatial strategy initiative within professional services, working directly with customers to develop and execute geospatial strategies. I also work with our advisors. Uh, under the Esri Advantage program, who um, is a, it's a consulting program that we run, and I help manage um, our domestic and global pool of advisors, which is about 250 people um, who deliver that type of service globally. Um, and I support internal uh, enablement efforts within our professional services team, focusing on our key delivery communities internally. So a few different hats that I wear uh, at Esri. Um, I've been with Esri for um, 12 years, which is hard to believe that that uh, time has come and gone that quickly, um, 12 years. Prior to that, I worked within uh, local government in um, Indiana, and I'm based in Columbus, Ohio, so not too far away from Wisconsin in the grand scheme of things. Um, I'm excited to present this content to you today. Um, I want to start by... Um, <laughs> this is this is one of those slides where um, every time I go to a conference, I uh, I kind of feel like this slide looks where I just I get a lot of information in a short period of time, and we have um, you know when we're working at conferences um, and getting to talk to people uh, in the expo areas in our booth, the thing we're always asked by customers is just where do I start? I've heard so much, I I don't know where to start, especially from a GIS manager perspective. Um, again, for those of you, um, if you can go into that participant panel, I think I cleared the results from the last thing. Can you click yes if you're a GIS manager? Get a sense of how many of you are in that role. We've got some yeses in the chat too. Okay, perfect. Yeah, there is that yes, no button. When you click on in Zoom, there's a per the participant button and there's a yes, no. I appreciate all the yeses in the chat though. That helps too, um, just to get a sense of that scale. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, maybe uh, for those of you who are in that role, maybe you've felt this before. Um, I think there's, uh, we get asked this all the time and the purpose of this presentation is to help you understand a framework that you can follow to understand where to start and maybe get the most out of your time and your investment in geospatial technology and uh, what the resources you have available. Um, Esri has worked to articulate a, uh, an approach that customers can follow to develop and execute a geospatial strategy built on these really simple pillars of understand, plan, and act. 
So today I'm gonna to walk you through what each of those um, parts of this process look like. Think about how it applies to you and your roles as GIS professionals um, and point you to some of the resources that Esri has to take you along this journey. But let's start by defining what a geospatial strategy is. A geospatial strategy defines how an organization will use GIS to achieve its goals. It's really simple. And we know that an effective geospatial strategy is tied not just to goals, but to business goals of an organization and that they're holistic, taking into account people, process, and technology needed to help overcome challenges and improve results for the organization. The really kind of simple way to think about this is that the more you know about your organization's business goals, the more you can clearly articulate business challenges that are preventing that organization from reaching those goals. When you do that, you have an opportunity to identify business-driven GIS solutions that help you as a GIS professional, especially those of you who are in GIS manager roles, quickly and concisely articulate the business value of GIS and what it's bringing to your organization. And sometimes it's easy for us to lose sight of these things, right? It's a, it seems straightforward, uh, but sometimes we get caught up in building solutions, implementing solutions, day-to-day -day management, keeping our infrastructures up to date, keeping our staff trained, doing all the things you're required to do, that maybe it's, it gets a little muddy sometimes drawing this clear line between what is my organization trying to do, whether it's a public or private entity, and what are the solutions I'm helping drive, and are they bringing value? And does that help everybody see the value of GIS? As a GIS manager, I would argue that this is your number one thing to articulate day in and day out. What am I doing? What is my staff doing? And how is it bringing value to my organization to help overcome challenges? What the reality of this is though, right, is there's um, every organization that I've ever worked with has limitations, right? You have more, uh, there's things that go into that decision-making process, time, budget, staff, the software you have, the buy-in you have from key staff, knowledge available, all of that goes into this funnel and only so much work can actually get done. Does this resonate with folks? For those of you who are in video, nod or shake your head and tell me I'm crazy, but thank you. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, hopefully this resonates, right? It's been true with every organization I've worked with. There's always more uh, demand than there is supply, right? There's always more that can be done than we have time to do. So how do we figure out where do we start? The key takeaways that I want you to have today are helping you understand why you need a strategy, what the key considerations are as you develop one, and how to successfully execute on that strategy once you have one in place. So why do you need a geospatial strategy? Well, we kind of touched on this a little bit. These are technical challenges that I would say a huge percentage, uh, I don't know what the actual percentage is, I have not, not done the official math, but I think a large percentage of, of the folks we work with day in and day out can relate to. There are legacy systems in place, we have limited exposure to new technology, staff that have training needs, sometimes architectures that are in need of an update, and maybe outdate or uh, in, in inconsistent public-facing content. And when we start with these technical challenges, this is an easy place to start. When, so when we think about those business goals, business challenges, sometimes we get derailed by thinking about technical challenges first. And if you're a, a technical person with a technical background, which most of our GS folks are, it's easy to start wanting to solve technical problems that you can identify. That, that's clear kind of, this is broken and I can fix it with these things. So you might think about the steps you'll take, right? Maybe your legacy system needs to be upgraded. You're gonna deploy some new technology. You're gonna train staff in pro. Your infrastructure is a little so-so, so you're gonna to go to the cloud and you're gonna create a hub premium site. Those are the technical steps you're gonna to take to solve those technical problems that I listed on the last slide. On the other hand, you might take these technical steps that could be just as justified and might solve all those problems. So instead of upgrading, you'll do a system architecture design, you'll deploy, uh, geo or insights instead of geo event. We're going to train our staff on enterprise instead of pro. We're going to rebuild on prem. We're going to upgrade existing web content. Well, the problem with this is that each of those sets of technical steps might alleviate those technical problems. And when we start with the technical challenges, we're faced with follow up questions to figure out well, which technical step do I take to solve this technical challenge? And anybody who's ever used our software knows that there's about six ways to do one thing. So you, it's hard to know which of those six ways to do it is the right way. And suddenly you end up having a whole lot of new questions. Uh, how do I build useful solutions? Where should I deploy? How do I know when it's modern? How do I know if something's improved? Where do I start training my staff? How do I leverage new capabilities? How do I market the GIS value and the value my team is bringing to our organization internally? 
and suddenly you maybe feel a little bit like that first slide looked and you're back here. Where do I start? So those technical challenges, this is all to tell you, maybe that's not the place to start. It's tempting because we can see quickly that our work has alleviated a problem, but it's not the place to start. Instead, I want you guys to think about starting by focusing on the business. So again, those business needs. Um, I know many of you work for the public sector. So when I say business needs, um, I don't mean commercial for-profit business needs, right? I mean, um, what is your city trying to do? What are the goals of your county? How will your mayor know if they've been, suc uh, they, they've been successful? What's important from a re-election standpoint? Um, what are the things you need and what are the things you can do from your role to help your organization be successful? And it will have nothing to do with the words GIS, right? It's gonna have to do with solving those bigger picture problems that are um, goals and aspirations for cities and counties uh, and, and as well as commercial organizations. So focusing on the business. The first step before you start building a strategy is to think about who are the people you need to make a strategy come to life. Um, most of you attending this conference probably fall into this champion category. I hope most of you do. Um, and a champion is somebody we define as somebody who believes that geospatial technology can bring value to their organization. Hopefully most of you can you relate with that uh, definition of a champion. Hopefully you identify in that role in some way, shape, or form, either in your past uh, roles or currently. An executive sponsor is somebody who can allocate time, uh, budget, and resources to bring that champion's vision to life, and they believe in that champion's vision. So maybe that's your uh, department manager, maybe that's your CIO, maybe that's your mayor. Um, county commissioner, whoever it is, right? You have some sponsorship, somebody who believes in the vision that you have. And then the technical leadership is the person uh, or group of people who can bring that vision to life, practically speaking and technically speaking, by implementing those solutions. Um, probably some of you wear multiple hats. Some of you are maybe the technical leadership and the champion. Does that resonate with, uh, with any of you, with being, wearing multiple hats? Uh, if you can go to the participant panel, again, this is in lieu of polls. I'm just going to click the yes, no, keep everything yes, no. Uh, okay, some of you wear multiple hats, right? Is that what those yeses are for? Great. Okay, how many, I'm going to clear those for a second. I know they're still coming in. Sorry, going to ruin the poll here. Clearing that. Okay, I'm asking a new question now. How many of you have found yourself wearing all three hats at once? Have you ever had to do that? David, Dean, Jeff. Jennifer, more than one person, right? Um, it doesn't work, does it? Does anybody <laughs> think that it works when you have to wear all three hats of those yeses? Feel free to chime in, go off mute if you'd like, if, you, if, you have, if you've had that experience where it's worked really well when you <laughs> had to wear all three hats. My guess is that it doesn't, um, or maybe put in the chat if, uh, if um, if you've had any uh, any challenges with that. It's really hard. And, and we find that with customers um, and people we work with all the time, that when you're trying to wear all three of these hats, it's very hard. You just simply don't have the time to implement solutions, champion solutions, and budget for solutions. It's very hard to do all three of those things. It's hard to wear two hats, let alone all three. So the first part of building a strategy is thinking about who's on your team, who, what role am I in, and then who are the other people that I need to bring in to make sure that this strategy can take off and work? Uh, all right, so once we, we know why we need one, we, we need one because we have more uh, supply than demand, because we know we can't start with just answering technical problems, um, and because we have a responsibility to articulate the business value of GIS and what it's bringing to my organization. So how do I establish a geospatial strategy? Well, we, like I mentioned, we have this framework, understand, plan, and act. So let's start with understand and think about what happens here in this part of the process. This is where we start articulating business goals. Business goals can look like different things. And like I mentioned, these are not uh, necessarily for-profit business goals. It could be things like improving collaboration between departments, helping people make better decisions, uh, reducing duplication, um, reducing uh, redundancies, um, helping do tasks more efficiently, um, improving the service delivery of something, making things more efficient and more effective, um, and sharing that success with the public. 
Um, those could be business goals. You, your organizations are probably much more specific than this, right? But this is just to give you a general sense of what business goals could look like. And then there are associated business challenges with those. Maybe there's duplicate efforts right now. Um, in, in almost every uh, local government um, that I've worked with over the years, very rarely is there, for example, one consistent address database, right? And so suddenly people are making decisions with two sets of addresses or two centerline data sets, or you know, maybe they have the outdated parcel data, maybe they have the current one, um, but sometimes that creates either multiple departments creating the same data, trying to answer the same questions, duplicating efforts. That leads to inconsistent decision making, or it takes a really long time to answer questions because we have to figure out who has the latest and greatest data and we have to kind of work to overcome those, uh, those workflow challenges. Um, inconsistent service, both internally and externally. So maybe people stop asking for help because they can't get the answers they want to get in the time that they need to get them. Um, and maybe that even could lead to trouble meeting mandates that are required. You have to answer this question in a certain time period. So these challenges that I have listed up here, these are all things that potentially could be addressed with geospatial solutions. There's different ways that could look, right? And today's presentation isn't going to be about talking about kind of which solution you configure and which you deploy, but one thing to think about as you start articulating business challenges is what are the, which of the common patterns of use that apply to geospatial technology um, would help address this problem? Um, this could be things like, like I mentioned, multiple address data sets. Well, that's a data management issue. Uh, and maybe a decision support issue. And these patterns of use become handy because we think about how they build upon one another, right? To have decision support, you need to have good data and data management. Um, to have sharing and collaboration, you probably need mapping and vis visualization. So they build upon each other and we can start thinking about how to think about a, whole, a, a holistic solution from a technology standpoint that will fully address the challenges that we've articulated that leverage GIS systems as they've been designed to be used. We also know that these patterns can help us connect technology with business needs. So if you're a champion and you're trying to gain executive sponsorship, what you probably don't want to do is go into that executive sponsor and start talking and arc this and arc that. It becomes unrelatable and confusing quickly for people who are not familiar with our technology. So you don't want to say, well, we need, to, we need 10 licenses of ArcGIS Pro and here's why. You want to say, we need to be better at uh, data management and we to do that need to use the latest technology to do that it's this and I will help you understand what it is we want to better share and collaborate and I ha I'm going to help work on a solution related to better sharing and collaboration amongst departments internally and externally you don't say I need to wire up ArcGIS Hub right so these patterns of use give you a way and it doesn't just even have to be Esri technology either right any technology applies to this you you need to typically you need a way as a GIS professional and a GIS manager to articulate the work that you do in common terms to the people who are not familiar with geospatial technology. And the patterns of use are that building block to help you connect what you do every day, complicated work you do every day, with patterns that are familiar and understandable to non-GIS professionals. To do this, this part of kind of another part of the hat you have to wear as a GIS manager is you have to engage with leadership and effectively communicate the work that you do or could do to the people who could be your sponsors and provide support to your organization. Uh, this could be elected officials, department managers, other key decision makers. But you as a GIS manager um, go out, right? And, and you have to sort of be an ambassador for, um, for GIS. And what you're doing as part of this engaging with leadership in the understand phase is understanding what's important to them so you're not trying to teach them about GIS, you're not trying to uh, wow them with demos and solutions and cool tools you've wired up at this point. You're just trying to understand what they need so that you can then, as the next step, design a solution that's gonna address the challenges you're hearing about. So it's going to them, understanding, talking to them, learning about what they do, learning about what keeps them up at night so that you can then think about, again, that next step of implementing a solution that's gonna address that. We also want to engage across our organization. So it's not just decision makers and the challenges that they're facing, but it's uh, the real world people who are gonna use your solutions and understanding what they need. 
um, what are your field workers or end users uh, or you know other decision makers use? Are there existing plans, existing solutions, existing things in place that you need to think about and take into consideration? Third-party solutions, uh, legacy technology, um, legacy workflows. What are those other things out there? And again, can that help you build your understanding of your organization, how it works today, and identify potential places for geospatial technology and geospatial solutions to alleviate a challenge? You know that you're ready to move from understand to plan when you've done a few key things. You've assembled that key group of stakeholders, the champion, the executive sponsor, and the technical leadership. You've artic articulated the business goals and the value to stakeholders, so you know what your organization is trying to do and the value that those uh, achieving those goals brings to the people who, who, who matter and who are affected by them. You understand the business challenges, both at that executive decision maker tier and at kind of the end user tier as well. And you're starting to think of high level potential geospatial solutions to identify the business challenges. That last bullet's important. I'm sorry. Because what you'll do as you go through this process is you'll find out that there are business challenges that have nothing to do with geospatial tech solutions, right? Politics, budgets, certain things that are just beyond the scope of what a geospatial technology solution can, can, can address. And that's okay, every organization has those, right? But what you're doing in this process and as you're talking to folks, is you're starting to, to make that link between the problems I see and the ones that have potential ge geospatial solutions. So you're not ready to build all of them yet, you're not ready to design all of them yet, but you're just saying like, this challenge is out of my wheelhouse and I'm not gonna work on it, but this one is something that I could see as fixing and addressing with geospatial technology. So then we, move into plan. And in plan, we're trying to build a roadmap that's gonna take us from point A to point B, uh, that it will be prioritized and will take us into the act cycle where we're ready to start doing some work. So this is where we start thinking about, again, those business-driven solutions, targeted training, reliable data, um, all, all the things, you know, things that are listed up here and other things beyond uh, that are solutions that have a geospatial component or could have a geospatial component to address those business challenges. So we're gonna have our current state and our future state, where we are and where we're headed. And that's what we're trying to define and plan. Where are we today and where are we going? And as you do that, you're gonna identify things you need to do to get from point A to point B. And those things you need to do are gonna be able to be classified. Are they things we need to do for people, for our process or workflows, or are they technology related? And we're gonna call those activities. So right now, the first thing you do is you start thinking about here we are today and here we wanna go. I'm gonna start making a list of all the things I need to do. And we're not ranking them, we're just listing them and classifying them right now. So that's the first step, listing out the things you need to do um, and then thinking about are they people, process, or technology activities. Once you have an idea of all the things, then you have to prioritize where you start. And there are lots of different ways and lots of different approaches to prioritization, but I'm going to show you two that are uh, the two that I use when I work with customers um, to get us started. And then we re refine and we iterate from here, but these are kind of the two places I start. So the first one is this concept of ease to launch versus business value. How easy is the solution to deploy and how much value does it bring to my organization? So when we're looking at this, we're thinking about um, trying to identify the things that fall into that upper uh, right quadrant to start the quick wins. Easier to do, high business value. Now easy to do doesn't mean, well there's a solution, uh, .arcgis.com, there's a template and I can wire it up. That's, that doesn't mean easy necessarily. It could be, it could be a component of that. But easier here means not only do you have maybe a solution template or a place to start when it comes to uh, code and the application you're trying to develop, it also means you have the data to support that, the infrastructure to support it, staff who understands how to use it, and a plan to maintain it. So it's more than just, is there a template and can I start there? It's what are all those other components look like? When it comes to high business value and what we're trying to identify there, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of organizations. That could mean I'm replacing a legacy workflow that costs us a lot of money to maintain. That could mean a quick, lightweight solution that touches uh, a lot of end users and uh, challenges um, challenges the way that uh, you know we we maybe do things with paper-based workflows or something like that, right? So it's not necessarily 
an expensive thing to do, but it's going to help a lot of people. It could be a solution that affects the public safety, health, or well-being of your constituents. Uh, it could be something that generates revenue. So there's lots of different ways to define business value. Um, and the important part is just that you understand that there are going to be some things that are going to be a lower value and some things that are going to be higher value in your organization. Um, note that that doesn't mean things are low value necessarily, right? Lower, higher, easier, harder. So it doesn't mean like we don't do things that are lower business value, right? Those things that fall into that um, harder to do, lower business value. If you've ever had to say no to somebody, or if you've ever had to say, I can't do this until November, this maybe gives you a way to help understand who you say no to, right? So it's not know your project's low business value, but it's not affecting as many people, or it's not um, impacting public safety, health, or well-being, or it's not generating revenue. And because of those things, whatever that business value scale you have, that maybe helps you identify what do I say yes to today and what do I say yes to in six weeks. We're obviously aiming, like I said, for the things that are in that quick win category. Um, but there are certainly things that we do that are hard work and take time, right, but are high value. So we don't throw those high value things away. We just help uh, our stakeholders understand like, yeah, I'm going to do this, but it's hard. And I know it's high value, but it's going to take time. So again, from a GIS manager perspective, um, I mentioned at the beginning, more supply that, or more demand than supply, right? more work coming in than you have time to do. And maybe this gives you an approach to figure out for your work and for your to-do list that you have. What do you say yes to? What do you say no to? And what? how do you organize where you start? I see some comments in the chat. This is, uh, it's nice to see. Um, better than important and urgent, right? That important and urgent one is, um, it's, it's fine. I think it's good for personal work, maybe, because you can tell, I can tell what's important um, and I can define that. Uh, but um, I think this is better from an organizational standpoint. Um, put the chart on the wall for people to see. So when I consult with customers, I draw this on a whiteboard back in the before time when we could go places and draw on whiteboards together. <laughs> if you remember that earlier in 2020. Um, I would do that, right? We would work together. We would draw these things up. We'd get a big list of things that we've identified that we want to do that support their strategy. We'd draw this on the whiteboard and we would start drawing and moving dots around or post-its are really good. Put all your activities on a post-it and then start rearranging them and figure out where they fit. It's a great exercise to go through. And if all of you have priorities and projects and things that you're thinking about, um, I would highly encourage you to go back to your office and think about, can you use this chart to think about what do I, where am I starting and do I, Am I confident that I'm doing things that are in this high value, quick win, higher business value category? Another reality that exists when it comes to prioritization, and I kind of touched on this with easier, that easier to launch, is easier to launch doesn't just mean I have the technology and the data. It means that I also have the skills. So this is another thing for you to think about, and it's called a skill will matrix. And this comes down to the people side of your organization. What are my people capable of doing? And what, do, what are they excited about doing? So some folks, probably all of you on the call, have high skills, right? Good, that's, high, that's great. We want people with high skills. When you have high skills combined with high will, people who are excited about work, excited about what they're doing, excited about new technology, changes, new solutions you're promoting, you're promoting and encouraging, that's uh, that upper right quadrant of delegate. That's our target, right? We want to have everybody who knows what they're doing and is excited about doing it, and we delegate them work. But not everybody falls into that category. Some people have high skills, but they are not excited about change. They don't want to do things differently. They don't want to take on new work. They like their paper-based workflow, and they want to keep it. And so for those folks, it comes down to exciting them. How do you excite them about changes that are coming? I found that the way to, to a way that works with that, or could, can work with that, is it comes back to the why. Why are we making these recommendations? Why are we asking you to change? So it's not just do this instead of that, and people are like, I don't, I don't need to, right? But if you can explain the why and the value that comes from that change in workflow, sometimes that can help get people excited. Going to the guide category up here, uh, low skill but high will. Um, I'll take that every time too, right? Teaching people what they need to do. They're excited, they're willing, they want to do it, they just don't know how. So that's kind of a teaching opportunity and a way to uh, find, find just kind of how to bridge that gap. 
And then those low skill, low will uh, quadrant um, presents challenges, right? And what that does is it doesn't mean we have to uh, fix that problem out of the gate, right? It, it's, it, that, that's a problem that can take time to solve and we have to have plans around solving. But what that can mean is that maybe it influences how hard or easy something is to launch. So if suddenly something that on paper looks like maybe it's easy to do, but I know that I have a group of people who are not going to be excited and they're not trained, maybe then it becomes a lower priority or you can safely adjust your timeline to reflect those challenges that exist when you have a low skill and low will uh, group that you have to work with. Hopefully these two things resonate. Um, there are lots and lots of other ways to prioritize, but these are the two things, if, if you could start with two things to prioritize, these are the two places I would start to figure out what that activity list looks like and how to put it in order. Your goal is to try to get this roadmap of prioritized and sequenced activities. I'm gonna do activity A, B, and C. What we know is that often those activities overlap. They require overlapping resources, time, and energy to do. But our, our goal as we build this roadmap is what are, where am I gonna start? What's the first activity? And what does it look like? So that I can then think about the independent act cycles that are gonna be required to complete that work um, and show meaningful return. You're ready to move to that act cycle when you have a definition of point B, right? What's that future state look like? The list of potential activities needed to get you from point A to point B, you've prioritized that. And the first thing you're doing, that first step, uh, point A on your roadmap, if you will, or step one on your roadmap is planned and defined. So then we're thinking about, we've developed our strategy and now it's time to execute. So how do we move from developing a strategy to executing it? So this is where we go into this act cycle, like I mentioned. The act cycle is, uh, has four kind of sub steps in it that you follow. Prepare, implement, operate, review. And we have specific things we do in each of these. Um, now the act cycle that you see um, in these steps, uh, for those who are familiar with project management, this can support an agile or a traditional waterfall project management approach. If you don't have that project management background, this is a really simple set of steps you can follow to just think about incremental execution of work um, and getting things done in, a, in an effective way. So we start with prepare. In prepare, we define a solution in detail, moving from conceptual to functional, and we start preparing our end users for upcoming changes. That's particularly important when we're thinking about those people who have the low will category, right? They're not so excited. So now is the time to start preparing them and getting them excited if we can. We move to implement where we build and configure solutions, test and deploy and train our users. Operate is where we go from test to production. We execute and we monitor the performance, provide ongoing support, and then review. Did we do what we planned to do? Did it work? If it did, we share the success. Uh, and then we make sure that things are being utilized and we consider if there are any additional workforce development needs that need to be taken into account. What you'll notice on this act cycle, and if you see on the slide, they just became bold. Each of those bottom bullets reflects a human component of the act cycle. So when we say people process technology, that's true throughout. So not just how you build the plan, what you develop and what you're thinking about, but how you actually execute too. So have we prepared our end users? Have we trained them? Do they know where support can be found? And can we consider those ongoing workforce development needs to make sure our staff is taken care of with those changes that were put into place? We know that these act cycles run in parallel, again, overlap, taking up similar time, staffing, teams, resources, energy, mental bandwidth, right? So it's, uh, it's making sure that you don't bite off more than you can chew. And if you go through this cycle of prepare, implement, operate, review on each act cycle, this helps you really ensure that things got done. Um, because sometimes these things do overlap and they do get muddy and they, they bleed into each other. So trying to think as much as you can in terms of um, uh, concise, uh, discrete act cycles helps you really measure the success of each one before you move on to the next one. We also know that some work is really complicated and it's not just, well, I uh, developed a, a widget, right? And I'm done, act cycle completed. Sometimes there's multiple tasks that fall into a single activity to consider an act cycle done. 
So you might go through this act cycle in multiple times before you say activity A is completed because I need to do task one, task two, task three, task four, follow that four step process for each of those subtasks and complete it. Um, this can, it sounds a little overwhelming when you think about it like that, but preparing can be really simple in terms of, I sent an email telling everybody that a new solution is going to be deployed in a few weeks and what, what the purpose is behind it. I, um, you know, kind of um, sketched out what my website's going to look like before I just start built it, building it and kind of really thought about what it's going to look like. Uh, it, so, you know, there, there's different levels of detail you have to do. It doesn't have to be a big overwhelming process for each of these, but I do think it's important to think, did I prepare? We, we know we build and deploy things all the time, right? Implement and operate are not hard for us to make sure we do. We build things and we put it in production. We build the next thing and put it into production. The challenge is that sometimes we can get stuck there. So for a lot of uh, folks we've worked with over the years, uh, the act cycle, we get stuck over here. We build and we push the next thing to production. We build another thing, we push the next thing to production. As soon as it's done, we're building the next thing. And we get stuck in this implement operate cycle. Some folks start there, right? There's no understand, there's no plan, there's no roadmap. We're just told we gotta build something so we start building it. So the trick is, can you recognize where you are in this understand plan act framework? And if you are frequently in the build and push to production kind of workflow, is there value in thinking about, well, wait, can I take a step back? Did I, did I, can I at least review if it worked? Once you've reviewed, can you think, how did this fit into the strategy? Is there a strategy? Can I articulate it? Do I know why I'm, the next thing on my build and to-do list is there? Um, so it's just a chance to think about where you fit in, where this works, and a pattern, again, that we see a lot um, from, our, from our GS professionals. Um, we all build things almost all of us push them into production. Those two pieces of this Understand Plan Act framework are our bread and butter. But it's these other pieces that we might not be as familiar with or as comfortable with that we're trying to kind of take a step back and think, how do I go from just building and deploying to doing something uh, a little bit more holistically and maybe that will help me better articulate the value of GIS and the value it's bringing to my organization. So, we have understand, plan, and act. And as you guys probably saw popping up from time to time on these slides, this little last swooping arrow that's super important that's called revisit. Um, so really this understand, plan, act framework is actually a four-step process. Understand, plan, act, and revisit. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, going back to this for just a second, um, again, familiar with 2020, <laughs> Um, probably everybody revisited a strategy or a plan of some kind, personal, geospatial, or otherwise, <laughs> that you had in 2020, and it was revisited. If ever there was a case for this swooping arrow to say, like, hold on, we might need to plan, plan B or C or D or whatever number we're on at this point um, is coming into play, this was the year for it, right? So um, the point is that this happens at a fluid place. It doesn't always happen at the end of an act cycle where things just kind of we got right this entire meeting here we are we revisited plan whatever this is <laughs> here we are but we're all happy to be here so that's okay um but it doesn't always happen at the end of the act cycle right we always don't always get to the end of the project when we have to revisit sometimes we don't even get to doing work before we revisit we understand and plan a few times and we're revisiting as we go like okay i think i understand the plan and then there was an election okay my plan changed right or i think i had a plan and then there was covid so my plan changed and i didn't start doing anything yet Sometimes we have a lot of work to do and we just have to get stuff done before we can get back to understand. Um, so sometimes that comes in waves, sometimes it comes one at a time. There's no tidy method for revisiting. There's no tidy process for revisiting. The important part is just to know that when you build strategy, uh, when you build a strategy, um, you're trying to build something agile and flexible that can be revisited because you know things are gonna change. Um, so we're not trying to build a plan that's like a 30-page, sit-on-a-shelf, beautiful 10-year plan. Um, that, that's nice, but probably irrelevant. Technology moves too quickly. Life moves too quickly. The world moves too quickly for those types of strategies to really be effective um, within a technology framework. So 
the last thing I want to show you is we get asked this question all the time. What does a geospatial strategy look like? How will I know when I've built one? Um, this can look like a lot of things. The main thing that I want folks to have when it comes to a geospatial strategy is the ability to concisely articulate why they are doing the next thing on their roadmap. I'm doing this next because it ties into this business goal of my organization, and if I accomplish this, I'm helping to solve this problem. That's all I want in a strategy. So it can be written on a napkin, right? It doesn't have to be, again, a big book of ideas, and it doesn't have to be a, a beautiful bound document. If you want to do that, and if you have the time to do that, by all means, go for it. But it doesn't have to be complicated. So for some, inter some organizations, I'm going to kind of show you different maybe levels of uh, depth that some of these strategies can look like and how they can be articulated. Um, so for some organizations, it's as simple as this, like I'm doing these things in this order and here's my, my plan. Um, and if you talk and ask this, the person who crafted this, they can tell you why these things are happening in this sequence. But things have been thought about, this roadmap has been articulated and they know that I'm going to do these things in this order. Once you start writing out more of those things that you're going to do, sometimes you'll find that you can classify them based on initiatives. So on the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see topics or initiatives uh, that are tied into work that's being done from the middle uh, over to the right side. So I'm going to do these different tasks in these different time frames, and they're tied to these various initiatives. And again, you can say, okay, the, the uh, operations center supports building an operations center for my organization, supports a key milestone, uh, that's going to support the public health and safety, right? And that's how GIS plays a role. And we can, you can quickly articulate that and have it visualized in terms of the work you're going to do. Sometimes you might have, uh, this is kind of just another way to, to articulate and visualize some of the things that you could do. Um, maybe step one is establishing your foundation and step two is building capability. And you're going to have a whole bunch of little things that happen related to that to make sure it can work. There's going to be complementary things that you're participating in throughout the year that are going to impact your bandwidth and your ability to get things done that you want to take into account, like attending events or taking training. And you can put it on a timeline here to see, can I actually get all these things done in the time frame? When I make um, visuals like this with my customers that I work with, um, sometimes people, including myself, get a little ambitious, right? And we're like, we can have all this done by December. And we start writing how many things we'd have to do per month to get everything done by December. And we realize, oh, just kidding. I can have this done by May, right? So just having the ability to look at what am I trying to do? When am I trying to do it? And can I realistically get it done knowing that maybe we don't spend 24 hours a day at work? Then we can get into more detail. So this is an example of an overview of a strategy that articulates a few key things, the mission and goals, value to the stakeholders, and then the people, process, and technology plan. Um, so keeping things in pretty simple terms still, um, but, but again, articulating, here's what our organization is trying to do, and here are the people, process, and technology things my GIS department is going to do to touch on that mission. We could get into even more detail, right? So the last one was just broadly, here are the things in, in kind of broad terms. And now I'm going to show you the action items, the roadmap, and what that's going to look like. So getting into more detail and articulating things on that roadmap that are related to high value things to do, quick wins to, that you can accomplish. For some organizations, this gets even deeper, right? So it's having things really classified in terms of uh, thinking from the bottom, the strategic initiatives, the strategy with each business foundational goal, an outcome, people, process, technology related once again, clear value proposition, and uh, both the geospatial vision and the mission overall for an organization. So again, this is just to show you, and you'll have all these slides and you can look at them. The, the point is that you can, um, you can go into as much detail as you need to build an effective strategy. And each one of those that I just showed you was very effective for that customer at their point in time. So there's no one right answer. There's no one size fits all. The important part, once again, is tying why you're doing the work that you're doing um, to, to the needs of your organization and being able to concisely articulate that. So just to wrap up, um, again, understand, plan, act, revisit this framework for developing and executing a strategy. Here's what you can do. Starting with understand, assemble your team, engage with people and talk to them about what their problems are and what the challenges they're facing are and what their goals are. Um, and articulate that, write that down. 
Then build a plan for what GIS can do to bring business value to address those goals. Create a plan that takes into account people, process, and technology. Prioritize your work and then start doing it and talk about what you've done. Talk about the work you've done. Revisit that strategy as you go um, and, and uh, show the correlation between the outputs from a GIS department as a GIS manager to the goals of your organization. There are a couple links to white papers and content where you can find a little bit more information on this topic. There's a lightweight white paper um, reviewing a lot of the things I just presented today, uh, which is uh, on the left. And then our accompanying Architecting the ArcGIS Platform Best Practices white paper, which is a really thorough document that takes you through um, some of the things related to designing solutions, building people, process, and technology, plans, um, and how, how you might go about doing that. So with that, I think hopefully right on time, about 10 minutes left for questions. Um, Jennifer, Kim, uh, is there, I think that, I think that's right. I think we're on time. <laughs> yeah, we are. Um, okay, perfect. And I haven't had any questions come through the chat. Um, feel free to submit them so we can. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I'm not seeing any yet. We could freestyle it for in a few minutes. Could just go off mute and everybody start shouting them out at once. Let's see what happens. But... Uh oh, slide connection just hiccuped. Hopefully not for everybody. Looks looks good to me. I guess I, I have a question. It's easier to speak than talk or type. Go for it. Um, when you're you brought up earlier in the presentation about, you know, being multiple roles, executive, sponsor, champion, technical leader, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges we always run into is having the leverage to get something done. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you can, you could be an executive sp sponsor, but you know, it helps sometimes to have uh, a department head that, isn't that interested they just want to have you do something get it done but they're not interested in championing something and then it just doesn't proceed get yeah proceed um and then you're kind of left holding the holding the bag mm -hmm. what uh, do you have some yeah i think there are strategies couple, i think there are a couple things with that so um the first is how near and dear Thing you're working on is really to the heart of that sponsor. Um, sometimes we have ideas about, uh, you know, as GIS professionals, and it doesn't mean they're, they're wrong. It just means that sometimes we want to work on things that we know are necessary and, and valuable, but that others don't maybe fully understand or see the value in. And sometimes to win those people over and to kind of build their trust and get them to better champion you, you have to start somewhere that isn't necessarily where you would want to start or isn't like the logical mm -hmm. starting place, even from a technical perspective, right? Um, prototyping some solution, doing something to show like, hey, I know sponsor, you care about this thing and I'm gonna show you a quick thing I could do. And if you, you give me a little bit more time, I could do this more efficiently because I have to do this other step first. Once I get that done, I'm gonna be able to do the thing you really want me to do really well. Um, but sometimes it comes down to that, right? So it, it, I, to me, I think it's a part of, um, goes back to that understand step like do, maybe maybe I if I'm working on something that I think is really important that my sponsor doesn't think is really important am I really working on the right thing and sometimes the answer is yes and there's politics and details as to why that answer is yes but sometimes the answer is no and we have to be open to seeing like maybe I do need to do something differently and start somewhere else and get buy-in in a different way or maybe it's working with a different sponsor um, again maybe doing something that um, you're going to do imperfectly, but do in a, in a way that's going to show value, right? So there's different, there's different pieces to that puzzle. And it, it, it definitely matters a lot. Um, uh, what the um, kind of political climate is for doing that at your organization, right? So there's no one size fits all answer on that either, but, um, but it's a great, it's a, certainly a challenge and it's a, it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Jerry. Yeah, hi, Anna. Um, does Esri offer any sort of a library of exemplary strategic plans for different 
types of organizations? Um, not that I know of. Um, this is a um, uh, most of those organizations. Um, well, all those organizations. It's their strategy and not Esri's. So they right. have kind of that ownership over it, right? And we want to, certainly that's how we see it, right? It's, um, it's those, that organization's geospatial strategy, not Esri's. So we have some of the foundational templates and things like that I showed you in the slides and we help customers right. build those. Um, what we could do, um, if, if you have questions, if you, um, uh, your Esri account manager is a great person to reach out to and they could help put you in contact with some of the customers we've built strategies for that would be happy, I think, to, to connect with you directly and talk with you. Um, but we, we keep the templates, but we don't keep the final products very often in that way. Right. Well, I was thinking if not a library, uh, URLs to those who are willing to share or so forth. But what you just said uh, works just as well. Yeah, happy, happy to bridge that connection. And I think as we continue to build out these resources and um, uh, as more organizations, I think one of the big things that we've seen kind of in the industry over the years is that people did used to have kind of big needs assessments and multi-page strategic plans for technology. And we've seen a shift where we are developing these more lightweight things, working with customers or the customers are developing directly. So I think we have a lot of like, kind of that older model stuff that we could point to and, and show you, but the newer stuff and kind of this more agile approach is uh, still kind of fresh. So I think a lot of people are still working on those and publicizing them internally and externally. So we certainly have examples and we've done this work directly with a lot of folks, um, but uh, it, it's kind of still a, a connection to help point you to those folks who have them to make sure that you can get the information and the context you need on them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have a question in the chat. There is a large difference between government and private industry. I'm really surprised at some of the hurdles. Do you have any suggestions for local state government? Those are certainly not the same as private company and its goals and such. Thank you. That was yeah. from Joe Martell. Yeah, Joe, that's a great point, right? D being able um, within private, the private sector, within the private sector, you can uh, usually find strategic plans that have been written that directly uh, have goals laid out in in really clear terms, at least for a lot of private sectors and commercial sectors. Um, and in state and local government, um, so I've worked in state and local government for uh, for years before I joined Esri, and my entire Esri um, consulting career has been in state and local government. So I certainly understand uh, that it's a different um, a different uh, approach to kind of what are the goals in state and local government? They tend to, uh, at the highest level, they correlate with um, mayoral or gubernatorial goals. Um, and sometimes those goals are really big and fuzzy and it's hard to think about how will the work I do as a GS professional tie into reducing crime in my city or um, you know, resolving racial equity issues or any you know other other big things that come up at that level, and um, the answer uh, that I I think um, we typically come up with is that in government those big picture uh, executive goals that exist they still exist right they're still there they're articulated most of the time, um, and then individual departments within state and local government. Um, have task force or initiatives or their own goals that should filter up to those big picture ones. And then you as a GIS professional within one of those departments has things you're doing. And I think the further you kind of keep going, it's, it's easy to disconnect the work you're doing as a GIS professional with those big picture things that you know your city or your state is trying to accomplish or your county. Um, so sometimes it's building this strategy helps you articulate um, what, what is the point of me building this really great geocoding, uh, uh, service that I'm building? Like what happens when I build this? What, what problem is solved? Um, so sometimes it's pointing to things like if I do this, it means that we're dispatching more effectively, or it means we're tracking our population and supporting them more effectively through community outreach or whatever. Right. So it's, I think that's part of it, right? Is being able to tie in the day-to-day -day things you're doing with those big picture, high-level executive goals that are still in place. Um, and sometimes 
sometimes we can't, right? And that's, I think, when even more argument for building that strategy so that you can say, I don't know. The next thing on my list, I have no idea how it supports my city. And if that's the case, which it sometimes is, um, is, uh, is it takes effort to kind of, to kind of put those pieces together. So I agree, Joe, it is very challenging. Um, and uh, if others have comments or ideas on this, happy, happy to hear it, but I do agree it is a challenge. All right, it looks like we're to the end of your time. Um, so thank you very much, Anna.